Hello. So I'm going to start with uh, the obvious, which is that we should all be eating more bugs than we are. <laughs> you know, that's, that's just easy. And of course, I'm not referring to the tiny, tiny bits of bugs that are in all your food anyway. Probably many of you are very aware that the FDA has been considerate enough to be concerned about your nutritional needs. And they know that since affordable food is important, we can't have the food manufacturers uh, you know, working incredibly hard to keep every single piece out that's really not practically possible. So therefore, there's limits involved. They're called action levels. You can look it up. I'll take my word for it. And I, I haven't figured out if, if other nations and other, you know, governments have the same thing, but they might. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with uh, a few of the before pictures. I have some cooked insect pictures later. Here we have, to, to, and of course you have insects, you know, that you can try later today, those of you who are ready. So uh, we have grasshopper, your number one consumed type of insect around the world, cicada. This is a particular species of caterpillar, uh, much beloved by certain Native American groups in the Southwest. Uh, beetles and ants. Um, a stink bug, which you wouldn't think stink bug, but mwah, really, very, very tasty. Very tasty, I tell you, I kid you not. All right, a uh, beetle grub, which looks particularly gross, I know, I know, but in some places this is uh, their filet mignon. And uh, that's a katydid, missing a back leg. And that is a commonly known as a toe biter, and uh, aka giant water bug, aka mangda in Thai, very tasty. And uh, then, focus on this picture, and then that one. Oh, look. Oh, he's pulling a fast one. Look at that. Anyone allergic to shellfish will be allergic to insects because they're that closely related. They're all arthropods, crustaceans, water bugs, insects, land bugs. So it's the same allergy. And of course, crab and lobster, very, very popular. Not for that long a period of time. Some of you know your lobster history. You know that lobsters were fit for swine and prisoners. And there used to be this reform in which prisoners were like, hey, it's cruel. You can't feed us lobster more than once a month. What are you doing? It's terrible. So they had to do prison reform around lobsters. Okay? Now it's like, hey, lobsters. And of course, what are crab and lobsters eating? Not the salad and green things that caterpillars and grasshoppers are. So, very much something to keep in mind. What this tells us is that food norms are not at all objective. They're subjective, they're mostly arbitrary, and of course the arguments for adoption of insects in our food source are incredible. They're multiform, very compelling. I'm going to touch upon them briefly, but what I really want to emphasize is me spending a lot of time giving you the critical thinking arguments for insect adoption, not going to do that much good. Maybe with you, maybe with you, but the fact is with the general public of America and developed nations, not going to do a lot of good. So I may say this more than once, using critical thinking arguments to address deeply entrenched cultural conditioning is like using a pair of needle nose pliers to open a fire hydrant. <laughs> Think about that visual. I, don't, I didn't get a slide of Trianto with the, with the needle nose pliers, but you can figure it out that it's just not going to work very well. Anyway, so, um, so in uh, December 2009, Professor Marcel Dika of Wageningen University did a presentation on entomology. He did a great job. He had four major points about why insects are better. The first point was they can't give us pandemics. <laughs> so the mass production of insects, farm insects, really easy. There's no cricket flu on par with avian flu or swine flu or E. coli. So when we think of the uh, occupational hazards of that or this or this, you know, and you don't have to scrub in to go into a cricket farm the way you would in a swine farm. So. Uh, beyond that, well, here is, uh-oh, well, I'm sorry it was cut off, but that was only the last column. So what we have here is we have uh, 11 insects and about 8 kinds of standard foods. Look, crickets are not better than beef in every category, just most of them. <laughs> Look, they don't have more protein than beef, but they have less fat, they have more carbohydrates, 
the calcium. You can you can do you can do you know play matchup between different criteria and different foods all day long. And what you'll find is that on the strict numbers, insects will compete with or outcompete any food that you care to name. What's not here? Amino acids. I got gotcha. you covered more or less on that. And this particular um, slide is very interesting for these two columns on the right. It tells you what a one to three year old needs and what a grasshopper provides. Not a grasshopper, about three ounces, 100 milligrams, three ounces. That's a small salad bowl of grasshoppers. <laughs> Which, by the way, there's a reason why they're eaten around the world. Quite tasty. You wouldn't necessarily know, but we'll get to that. Maybe we'll be addressing that today. So you'll see that it's like, well, gee, the numbers are kind of impressive for nutrition. And uh, oh, I uh, jumped to this. Well, all right. So what do we have here? We have a cave drawing. This is Altamira. And my main point is this. Rather than simply provide you with all of the information, what I want to do is I want to address why insects bad, big bony animals good. So what I want to do is I want to take you on a very quick tour of our childhood as a species. Like these are very fancy finger paintings. And what are the paintings of? Of the animals that are of interest in terms of, of feeding us. So the animals that we hunted, and so that's more, of, that's more of them, and the animals that hunted us, big animals. Big animals terrorized us even when we hunted them. The upside was that not only did you get a huge amount of food uh, for your village and your family, but you had a whole warrior culture. Had a whole warrior culture, the death of the hunter, you know, it's really good. The hierarchy, the status thing of being a hunter, it's incredible. Well, you had the one insect cave painting from before, getting not only honey, but bee brood. But look, that's Vanuatu, so it's not just a European thing. Big animals were big in the human psyche all over the world. But here's one of a guy who's not so successful in his hunt. You can just barely make him out being squashed by a big beast there, see? All right? So therefore, which would you rather be, this guy or that guy? So we went from hunting animals to domesticating them. We crystallized our control over them and our control over nature. It's like, hey, look, we're all set. Pretty soon, you've got them in agriculture. Better than those pesky locusts that are eating your food. They're the competition now. All right, so look, we, they're in our families, and we are cooking them up. That's great. Flash forward 4,000 years, and we're still trying to live that way, back when there were 40,000 people on planet Earth. Why? Well, you know, for the same reasons, I guess, that they did. They taste pretty amazing. I enjoy them. But what's the future in it? If you look at the resource use and the ratio of resource input, to food you take out, very stark, very stark, not only for cows and pigs, but especially for them. Okay, so, and of course, other than colonialism, which I can't get into right now, we have industrialization. Industrialization over the last 150 years took people away from the land where they were dealing with insects all the time and saw the way that insects contributed to the world that we enjoy, how the world that we enjoy is possible because of insects. It put us in these. In which case, we are not only working in offices, but we're living in cities. Insects become the enemy. They're dirty, they're disease-bearing, they're disgusting. So therefore, it doesn't take that many generations to make insects completely unacceptable. There's a lot of costs that go with that in terms of how we feed ourselves and what kind of future we have. So, all right, this is Thailand. These are delicious. Bamboo caterpillars. I enjoy them very much. Uh, these are Chapulinas in Mexico. They're crazy about them. And Mopani worm in South Africa. So in all these cases, and in many cases around the world, people will pay more in the marketplace for insects than they will for foods that you and I enjoy. So let's not start thinking that the majority of cases are, well, they really don't want to starve, so they'll eat insects. Insects are a major part of their culture in terms of food. Now, interesting thing is that that seems to be shrinking down, and I'd love to talk more about that, but for the moment, well, that's a bowl of crickets that I uh, worked on at an international conference of edible insects, 
and I look forward to sharing that with some of you today. Thank you very much.